Hello, and welcome to The Essential Reads. My name is Isaac, and my goal is to bring you a bunch of classic audiobooks in an easy and accessible way. This show is brought to you by my store, where you can purchase all my audiobooks after publication on YouTube for five euros. It is the easiest way to help me transform this, not just from a passion, but into a job. Let's get started. The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne Chapter 7 The Governor's Hall Hester Prynne went one day to the mansion of Governor Bellingham with a pair of gloves which she had fringed and embroidered to his order, and which were to be worn on some great occasion of state. For, though the chances of a popular election had caused this former ruler to descend a step or two from the highest rank, he still held an honourable and influential place among the colonial magistracy. Another, and far more important reason than the delivery of a pair of embroidered gloves, impelled Hester, at this time, to seek an interview with a personage of so much power and activity in the affairs of the settlement. It had reached her ears that there was a design on the part of some of the leading inhabitants, cherishing the more rigid order of the principles in religion and government, to deprive her of her child. On the superstition that Pearl, as already hinted, was of demon origin, these good people not unreasonably argued, that a Christian interest in the mother's soul required them to remove such a stumbling block from her path. If the child, on the other hand, were really capable of moral and religious growth, and possessed the elements of ultimate salvation, then, surely, it would enjoy the fairer prospects of these advantages by being transferred to a wiser and better guardianship than Hester Prynne's. Among those who promoted the design, Governor Bellingham was said to be one of the most busy. It may appear singular, and indeed not a little ludicrous, that an affair of this kind, which in later days would have been referred to no higher jurisdiction than the select men of the town, should have been a question publicly discussed, and on which statesmen of eminence took sides. At that epoch of pristine simplicity, however, matters of even slighter public interest, and of far less intrinsic weight than the welfare of Hester and her child, were strangely mixed up with the deliberations of legislators and acts of state. The period was hardly, if at all, earlier than that of our story, when a dispute concerning the right of property in a pig not only caused a fierce and bitter contest in the legislative body of the colony, but resulted in an important modification of the framework itself of the legislature. Full of concern, therefore, but so conscious of her own right that it seemed scarcely an unequal match between the public on one side and a lonely woman backed by the sympathy of nature on the other, Hester Prince set forth from her solitary cottage. Little Pearl, of course, was her companion. She was now of an age to run lightly along by her mother's side, and constantly in motion from morn till sunset. Could have accomplished a much longer journey than that set before her. Often, nevertheless, more from caprice than necessity, she demanded to be taken up in arms. But was soon as imperious to be set down again, and frisked onward, before Hester on the grassy pathway, with many a harmless trip and tumble. We have spoke of Pearl's rich and luxurious beauty, a beauty that shone with deep and vivid tints, a bright complexion, eyes possessing intensity both of depth and glow, and a hair already of a deep, glossy brown, and which, after years, would be nearly akin to black. There was a fire in her and throughout her. She seemed the unpremeditated offshoot of a passionate moment. Her mother, in contriving the child's garb, had allowed the gorgeous tendencies of her imagination their full play, arraying her in a crimson velvet tunic of a peculiar cut, abundantly embroidered with fancies and flourishes of gold thread, so much strength of colouring, which must have given one and pallid aspect to the cheeks of a fainter bloom, was admirably adapted to Pearl's beauty, and made her the very brightest little jet of flame that ever danced upon the earth. But it was a remarkable attribute of this garb, and, indeed, the child's whole appearance, that irresistibly and inevitably reminded the beholder of the token which Hester Prim was doomed to wear upon her bosom. It was the scarlet letter in another form. The scarlet letter endowed with life. The mother herself, as if the regignomy was so deeply scorched into her brain that all her conceptions assumed its form, had carefully wrought out the similitude, lavishing many hours of morbid ingenuity to create an analogy between the object of her affection and the emblem of her guilt and torture. But in truth, Pearl was the one as well as the other, and only in consequence of that identity had Hester contrived so perfectly to represent the scarlet letter in her appearance. As the two wayfarers came within the precincts of the town, the children of the Puritans looked up from their play, or what passed for play with those sombre little urchins, and spake gravely one to another. Behold, verily, there is the woman of the scarlet letter, and moreover, 
there is the likeness of the scarlet letter running by her side. Come, therefore, and let us fling mud at them. But Pearl, who was a dauntless child, after frowning, stamping her foot, and shaking her little hand with a variety of threatening gestures, suddenly made a rush at the knot of her enemies, and put them all to flight. She resembled, in her fierce pursuit of them, an infant pestilence, the scarlet fever, or some such half-fledged angel of judgment, whose mission was to punish the sins of the rising generation. She screamed and shouted, too, with terrific volume of sound, which doubtless caused the hearts of the fugitives to quake within them. The victory accomplished, Pearl returned quietly to her mother and looked up, smiling into her face. Without further adventure, they reached the dwelling of Governor Bellingham. This was a large wooden house, built in a fashion which there are specimens still extant in the streets of our elder town, now moss-grown, crumbling to decay, and melancholy at heart with many sorrowful or joyful occurrences, remembered or forgotten, that have happened and passed away within their dusky chambers. Then, however, there was a freshness of the passing year on its exterior, and the cheerfulness gleaming forward from the sunny windows of human habitation, into which death had never entered. It had, indeed, a very cheery aspect, the walls being overspread with a kind of stucho in which fragments of broken glass were plentifully intermixed, so that when the sunlight fell aslantwise over the front of the edifice, it glittered and sparkled as if diamonds had been flung against it by the double handful. The brilliancy might have fitted Aladdin's palace rather than the mansion of a grave old Puritan ruler. It was further decorated with strange and seemingly cabalistic figures and diagrams suitable to the quaint taste of the age which had been lain in the stucho when newly laid on, and had now grown hard and durable for the admiration of aftertimes. Pearl, looking at this bright wonder of a house, began to caper and dance, and imperatively required that the whole breadth of sunshine should be stripped off its front and given to her to play with. No, my little Pearl, said the mother, thou must gather thine own sunshine. I have none to give thee. They approached the door, which was of an arched form, and flanked on each side by narrow towers or projections of the edifice, in both of which were lattice windows with wooden shutters to close over them at need. Lifting the iron hammer that hung at the portal, Hester Prim gave the summons, which was answered by one of the governor's bond servants, a freeborn Englishman, but now a seven years slave. During that term, he was to be the property of his master, and as much a commodity of bargain as the sale of an ox or a joint stool. The serf wore a blue coat, which was the customary garb of serving men at that period, and long before in the old hereditary halls of England. Is the worshipful Governor Bellingham within? inquired Hester. Yeah, forsooth, replied the bond servant, staring with wide open eyes at the scarlet letter, which, being a newcomer to the country, he had never before seen. Yeah, his honourable worship is within, but he hath a godly minister or two with him, and likewise a leech. You may not see his worship now. Nevertheless, I will enter, answered Hester Prynne, and the bond-servant, perhaps judging from the decision of her air and the glittering symbol in her bosom that she was great lady of the land, offered no opposition. So the mother and little Pearl were admitted into the hall of entrance. With many variations, suggested by the nature of his building material, diversity of climate, and a different mode of social life, Governor Bellingham had planned his new habitation after the residencies of gentlemen of fair estate in his native land. Here, then, was a wide and reasonably lofty hall, extending through the whole depth of the house and forming a medium of general communication, more or less directly, with all the other apartments. At one extremity, this spacious room was lighted by windows of the two towers, which formed a small recess on either side of the portal. At the other end, though partly muffled by a curtain, it was more powerfully illuminated by one of those embowed hall windows which we read of in old books, and which was provided with a keep and a cushion seat. Here, on the cushion, lay a folio tome, probably the Chronicles of England, or other such substantial literature, even as in our own days we scatter gilded volumes on the centre table to be turned over by the casual guest. The furniture of the hall consisted of some ponderous chairs, the backs of which were elaborately carved with wreaths of oaken flowers, and likewise a table in the same taste, the whole being of the Elizabethan age, or perhaps earlier, and heirlooms transferred hither from the governor's paternal home. On the table, in token that the sentiment of old English hospitality had not been left behind, stood a large pewter tankard, at the bottom of which, had Hester or Pearl peeped in it, they might have seen the frothy remnant of a recent draught of ale. On the wall hung a row of portraits representing the forefathers of the Bellingham lineage, some with armour on their breasts, and others with stately ruffs and robes of peace. 
all were characterised by the sternness and severity which old portraits so invariably put on, as if they were ghosts rather than pictures of departed worthies, and were gazing with harsh and intolerant criticism at the pursuits and enjoyment of living men. At about the centre of the oaken panels that lined the hall was suspended a suit of mail, not, like the pictures, an ancestral relic, but of the most modern date, for it had been manufactured by a skilful armourer in London, the same year which Governor Bellingham came over to New England. There was a steel headpiece, a cuirass, a gorgeous and greaves, with a pair of gauntlets and a sword hanging beneath. All, and especially the helmet and breastplate, so highly burnished as to glow with white radiance and scatter an illumination everywhere about upon the floor. This bright panoply was not meant for mere idle show, but had been worn by the governor on many solemn muster and training field, and had glittered, moreover, at the head of a regiment in the Pequod War, for, though bred a lawyer and accustomed to speak of Bacon, Coke, Neuer, and Finch as his professional associates, the exigencies of this new country had transformed Governor Bellingham into a soldier, as well as a statesman and ruler. Little Pearl, who was greatly pleased with the gleaming armour, as she had been with the glittering frontispiece of the house, spent some time looking into the polished mirror of the breastplate. Mother! cried she. I see you here! Look! Look! Hester looked, by way of humouring the child and she saw that, owing to the peculiar effect of this convex mirror, the scarlet letter was represented in exaggerated and gigantic proportions, so as to be greatly the most prominent feature of her appearance. In truth, she seemed absolutely hidden behind it. Pearl pointed upward, also, to a similar picture in the headpiece, smiling at her mother, with an elfish intelligence that looked so familiar an expression on her small physiognomy. That look of naughty merriment was likewise reflected in the mirror, with so much breadth and intensity of effect that it made Hester Prynne feel as if it could not be the image of her own child, but of an imp who was seeking to mould itself into Pearl's shape. Come along, Pearl, said she, drawing her away. Come and look into this fair garden. It may be that we shall see flowers there, more beautiful ones than we find in the woods. Pearl, accordingly, ran to the bow window at the further end of the hall, and looked along the vista of a garden wall, carpeted with closely shaven grass, and bordered with some rude and immature attempt at shrubbery but the proprietor appeared to have already relinquished as hopeless the effort to perpetuate on this side of the Atlantic, in a hard soil, and amid the close struggle for subsistence, the native English taste for ornamental gardening. Cabbages grew in plain sight, and a pumpkin vine, rooted at some distance, had run across the intervening space and deposited one of its gigantic products directly beneath the whole window, as if to warn the governor that this great lump of vegetable gold was as rich an ornament as New England earth would offer him. There were a few rose bushes, however, and a number of apple trees, probably the descendants of those planted by the Reverend Mr. Blackstone, the first settler of the peninsula, that half-mythological personage who rides through our early annals, seated on the back of a bull. Pearl, seeing the rose bushes, began to cry for a red rose, and would not be pacified. Hush, child, hush, said her mother earnestly. Do not cry, dear little Pearl. I have voices in the garden. The governor is coming, and the gentlemen along with him. In fact, and down the vista of the garden avenue, a number of persons were seen approaching towards the house. Pearl, in utter scorn of her mother's attempt to quiet her, gave an eldritch scream, and then became silent. Not from any notice of obedience, but because the quick and mobile curiosity of her disposition was excited by the appearance of these new personages. Thank you so very much for listening. If you enjoyed, please like, comment, share, all that jazz, and if you really enjoyed, do subscribe, because there's more to come. And if you're listening on podcast, please leave a review. It is the easiest and quickest way to get this in front of as many people as possible, and it really makes my day to read them. So if you could do that, that'd be great. Once again, thank you for listening. And until next time, bye-bye.